Alright, should be making a video. Draftphysics.com and such. Uh, yeah, uh, Draft Science, the YouTube channel. This sort out the confusion, if any. Um, so anyway, I'll do a few comments, and I guess I'll just talk about stuff, because there isn't that much in the comment section uh, lately. Which is, some of that's pleasant, because it's not all this snarky crap. It just sort of wastes time. Um, so we can talk about physics instead of bullshit. So, uh, the Pyro left a bizarre comment. Um, Gary, I have to say you are starting to sway me a bit. Okay, whatever that means, who knows, grain of salt, all that kind of crap. Um, but it is a rather miraculous change from the you're just a wacky, evil, stupid denier and blah blah blah, all that kind of shit. <laughs> so, um, yeah. So, at least he's starting to eat some of his words, maybe. Ah, good. Uh, we'll make a new video soon. So, as usual, Pyro has a different definition of most words in human vernacular. And soon means who knows when. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't have anything to do with, like, internet time. It's already been two months. Um, you know, two days. That's like, you know, that's a long time in internet days. Uh, but anyway, it doesn't... Good, make a video. I'd like to, yes, I'll watch it. I watch physics videos, so if people make physics videos, I'll watch them and f complain if I can't stand the physics is so bad. Uh, so hack account, which is really irritating and has this stupid anonymous mask thing, which I always found really obnoxious and Borgish. I mean, it's so funny that the people who are anti-Borg are more Borg than the Borg. Which, you know, is funny. They need their anonymity so they can commit crimes. <laughs> you know, they don't need it for any good purpose. They're just evildoers. Uh, you know, they've painted their black-white hats thing. You know, they're just it's just paint. They're still wearing black hats. All right, you take criticism really well. Uh, I don't think so, but whatever. Even though I do disagree with you, I want you to know... Well, disagree about what? See, that would be interesting to know. What do you disagree about? You know, what? What is it? Where, where is it even possible to rationally disagree with me? I just don't think a rational person can disagree with me. It just can't happen. I want you to know that you need to keep doing what you're doing. So this is one of those people who... I don't agree with you, but I think you should confuse people some more with stuff I think is wrong. I mean, it just doesn't make any sense. Why would I suggest to somebody who's full of shit, I think they're full of shit, and say, yes, spew more shit into the, you know, make some more noise so the signal is lost entirely and everybody does this chicken with the head cut off chaos thing instead of something rational. No, don't. If if I disagree with you, shut the fuck up. Don't let the haters bring you down. Well, you know, the fact that somebody does disagree doesn't bring me down. Disagreeing is okay. It's the fact that they do so irrationally that's the problem. You know, without making a counter argument to the actual physics suggested. Only the children of ignorant will argue back with insults. Well, I don't mind a little give and take on that score, to tell you the truth, but whatever. Um, and not actual reason. Yes, there has to be argument. There has to. This is a trial, and somewhere in this trial process, you can have antics. You know, you can sing songs like, If the glove doesn't fit, you must acquit. You can sing some silly song now and then. But yeah, it always should come back to, wait a minute, there's a ton of fucking goddamn evidence. Follow the evidence, idiots. Uh, so yeah, uh, thanks, I guess. <laughs> I guess that's a positive comment, right? Maybe. Um, anyway, all right, so this is a, a Ken Wheeler nonsense video, so uh, remark. So these defenders are just so fucking stupid. John John says, you're really not debunking anything. Well, I think I am. I'm overtly presenting evidence, proving, essentially demonstrating with evidence that what Ken Wheeler's saying isn't actually true. 
that's what I'm doing. I am debunking it and I'm challenging it by saying things like, what the fuck are you talking about? If there's such a thing as dielectricity, why don't you explain to me how dielectricity is different than regular electricity? Because I can't find any distinctions anywhere in the universe. Just saying shit in such a way to make dude sound funny or retarded. I don't make him sound like anything. I play his video and I respond. Now, how exactly is that distort what he says? His shit sounds stupid all on its own. It's funny and retarded all by itself. It doesn't even need me to do it. I could just pause the video and you could fill in the holy shit that was stupid and retarded all by yourselves. Because when he says something about the hyperburloid entering counter space with no uh, magnitude, you should say, holy fuck, that was a retarded sentence. I shouldn't have to tell you it was retarded. It's... It smells of retardation. Uh, so here we go. No capital letter. Uh, there is. There is, is. Multiple sources of light. To give it more lines to look at. Well it's not a matter of what you're looking at. The point is. is are the lines that you're seeing. A representation of how tr photons are traveling. Or are the lines you're seeing something entirely different, made up of a composite of completely different things? Is what you think you're seeing what you're seeing? Or are you seeing something much more complicated than you think you're seeing? You're not seeing light being bent by anything. That's not fucking happening. And I proved it's not what's fucking happening. I presented all the evidence a reasonable person needs. I'll draw you a picture. Um, magnetic fields are curved. No, they're not. So that's another stupid thing you think because you people have misinterpreted what Maxwell and Faraday said and what they demonstrated how forces work. They basically demonstrated that mathematically they act just as if they were radiating lines, vectors of specific intensity of force. And the field lines are just a representation of the magnitude at that distance. And that's all they are. If you want to say, uh, where's the three pressure, the three amount, or the two amount? Well, you'd end up drawing, well, here's where two is, here's where two is, here's where the ray is two, here's where the ray is two. And you find out, oh, it's a perfect circle representing the surface of the object. And then the three is a ring a little bit wider because it's a little weaker. And four is a little weaker. And those lines are just representations of the intensity of the rays being emanated by the charged object. So you're the one who doesn't understand physics, dupe. All right, another no capital. Hence, when you put a magnet in the middle of a bunch of metal filings dust, the filings aligned in a curved way. They don't move in a curved way. That's right, they align in a curved way because they're being hit by magnitudes of force from both poles of the magnet. So they're getting a certain amount of the north energy and a certain amount of the south energy. And they react, their poles react differently to the two things. The north wants to attract the north, but it repels the south. So it can't, it can't move towards the north if it has to get closer to the south. It can only move towards the north if it also is moving away from the south pole. There's certain rules, and that's why the filings turn a certain way and line up a certain way. <laughs> And that's exactly the point. That's how it really works. Nothing gets bent. Things just realign. Dielectric is an actual word. And never in any of the videos did I say a dielectric is an actual thing, a substance. Dielectrics are insulators. The definition is it's an insulator that has certain properties where they can hold charge on its surfaces. That's what a dielectric is. There is no such thing as dielectricity. That's the word I said they made up that has no reality, has no correlation to something real in the world. There's no such thing as dielectricity. Boy, you people can't even pay the fuck attention at 50 minutes. You actually explain how the ferro cell is working. Yes. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Of course, multiple light sources are going to equal more lines. Well, the point is, is it's exactly, uh, ge the geometry is actually one for one. I mean, it's one line that curves like a S. Um, 
for each LED. Yes, there is no there is no source creating a curved line. It's perpendicular to the source. The source is obviously just creating reflected light. You're not seeing the source light bent. You're seeing the source light being scattered and reflected at different angles uh, from different positions of the ferro material. So there is no no light ever bends. Um, of course, multiple light sources. Uh, why does that make you upset? There's nothing that it's not making me upset. What's making me upset is when people lie that they're changing the speed of the light or that they're bending light. The ferro cell, the magnetic field, does not bend any light rays at all. Okay, around 50-50, you ask a ass ton of questions. <laughs> wow, I did? All in that one second or that one minute? Ken makes visuals to explain his theories. And I've pointed out the visuals. I have read his book. I did a video showing some of the nonsense. The incomprehensible silly images for which there's no explanation for how things toroid or how they hyperburloid or how they do any of that crap. What's causing the effect? No explanation. If you want to actually understand his theories, watching a 10 minute video isn't going to satisfy you. Well, quite obviously, I've watched many of his 10 minute videos like all of them on the subject of magnetism. So, again, how have I failed to fairly represent his opinion? I haven't failed to do so shit for brain. Liar. <laughs> yeah. Maybe start reading his free publishing online. I have read it and talked about how it's the most incomprehensible pile of slop ever written. That it just keeps requoting the same quotes over and if you take out all the quotes from Tesla and other assholes the book would probably be 10 pages this whole video I feel like you're just upset that the ferro cell is making more than one line of magnetism it doesn't make anything <laughs> it doesn't make anything it just provides little bits of iron to reflect light uh, and that's it. It doesn't make anything. Because of the multiple LEDs, which is the whole point of the ferro cell. So again, no it's not. It's not what Ken Wheeler says the ferro cell is doing. He implies the ferro cell is bending light beams. That's his implication. That's clearly what he says. He doesn't talk about how the ferro material is not aligned that way. That it doesn't align in those curved lines. There is no piece of the ferro cell that is a curved anything. There's no curves created by the magnet in the ferro cell. The curves are purely a manifestation, an emergent property of the light being cast in multiple directions and it reflecting only from ones that have the right angle to get to your pupil. If you think dude, I'm not your dude boy, um, so um, you know, grow up and find better rhetoric. Um, you know, dude is a world for kids. For idiots, really. Bill and Ted, they were idiots. <laughs> you know, dude is a word basically saying, I'm dumb and he's dumber. Uh, should explain it simpler. If you think dude should explain it simpler, yeah, I think the fat guy ought to do better. I think he ought to, ex he ought to say something about something that can be demonstrated with something called evidence, like an experiment that's honestly described. He doesn't do any honestly described experiments. Then maybe you should make a debunk video. That's exactly what I'm doing, idiot. And so he says, about 10 minute video. Well, you show me where somebody builds something right faster than somebody builds something wrong. So it's really easy to say something stupid and wrong and do it real quick. It's a lot harder to say it right, to explain it correctly, to be fair to the evidence. That takes longer. That's just the rules of the game. It's easier to knock something down than it is to build something up. Just a fact, shithead, that you're clearly one of the numerous facts you haven't learned yet in your stupid, putrid life. Uh, that is less than 30 minutes. So again, you have some sort of rule or law that's <laughs> that, that says, what, 
information must come in 10 minute bites or it isn't valid so you would watch a 10 minute instruction video to build a nuclear power plant oh if it takes longer than 30 minutes no I can't do it no no you have to make it a 10 minute video fuck you of course till dead Jack ass. I'll just delete it. Oh, crap. All right, so let's draw the pharaoh cell. Let me do that one first. All right, so this is what really happens in the pharaoh cell. Pretty close, anyway. Because I'm not, I'm not going to say I'm getting every single piece of the geometry correct. Just much better than the crap these other assholes are saying or implying. So basically, what happens when you put a magnet on the ferro cell is obviously one side of the magnet when it's north to south, say this is the north side facing up, and here it's on the top of the ferro cell. Um, the LEDs are positioned around the periphery, equidistant mostly, and uh, as pointed out, they're shooting light in all directions. Yeah all vectors. Great, the pen stopped working. Super cool, excellent, fantastic. I'm so pleased. <laughs> yeah, that's just so cool of you. Wow, my hand is... I don't know whether it's a residual from the stroke I had years ago or what. Yeah, my ability to draw a straight line is diminishing. Oh, come on. It writes down here. <laughs> yeah, it's working down there. Why isn't it working up here? So anyway, the lines are coming out straight. Oh, come on. I just don't have another pin. Um, sorry. All right, and the trick is, is that the ferro cell, the magnet. So when the when the magnets got you know the north now north or south face facing up. Uh, what is going to happen is the little bits of ferro material are going to line up, okay, completely perpendicular to the surface. And they're going to be just like the light, they're going to be radial, okay, so they're all just going to line up. And that's what I showed by using a, a microscope and looking at the pattern created by a small magnet. And that's exactly what you're getting. So the density is thicker, close, and it gets thinner farther away. But that's exact all it's doing. And the trick is, is that this LED, so if you did this with one LED light, you would see what it's creating. And what it's creating is a, a line that goes something like this, okay, through the ferro cell. And what it's representing is the angle that the light reflects to your eye it's hitting different ones of these rays. So these rays are really close together, these little bits. They're very close together. And they're all lined up. You know, they have a length to them. The little ferro bits are not round bits. They're little long bits. And they line up with the field. That is, if this is north, they're all got their south ends pointing towards the north end. And so they all line up like that, and they're, they're just little pieces of mirror. And one piece reflects light to your eye from here, this other ray reflects it to here, this other ray from here, this other ray from here, the other ray from here, just like that. And so it's just the angle of the little bit, what angle it's at, decides how the light can get to your pupil. So it has to be the right angle to get to your eye. And so that's what's creating the curved line. But it's being made of reflections off a bunch of radial spokes. And so there's no light bent. It's just reflecting off the little mirror pieces of ferrofluid. And for each LED, a new line is made at a different angle. So each LED is creating perpendicular to it. Okay, the lines are always perpendicular. That is, the LED is here and the line will be here. 
So for each LED, so the LED over here will create one that's going this way. Oh, I did it backwards. Okay, going this way. And so that's how you get that swirling pattern is just because each LED is going to create a, perpen a line perpendicular to it. And that line has nothing to do with light traveling that path. It has to do with individual photons reflecting to you from different locations. That's how the thing works. I think it's clearly the evidence demonstrates it. The, the microscopic view of the ferrocell demonstrates no curvature, no movement, no action at all. Once you put the, the magnet there, the ferro material takes a few minutes to everything to arrange and then it just settles and stays that way. And that's it. There's just no magic to it. So it's just all a pile of crap. This this whole giving people the impression that it's you know giving you a view of some magical thing happening around magnets. It's deceptive if somebody doesn't explain it accurately and fairly and all that crap. All right, so another subject I wanted to get to that I thought was important. Okay, light. Um, photons. So I've talked about how um, you know energy can't be created or destroyed, and that's the thing to understand is that things moving the speed of light can't be. But photons, the fact that you have energy at a frequency, bullets at a frequency, that can be destroyed, and that can be created. So photons in the universe aren't some kind of natural thing. There's something that has to be caused by something first. Something has to cause photons. Uh, something has to put the little bullets in a sequence. Now you could argue that if the universe is random, then it would have um, lots of opportunity to, to shoot bullets at a frequency in the sense that you know it could just randomly have bullets at a frequency at a specific distance from each other. Um, that's always the same. And it could have any number. It could have just two of them at the same frequency, or it could have three that could get sent at the same frequency, or it could have four, or it could have five. So that would be a natural photon. So you could say the cosmic background radiation has these photons covering the whole electromagnetic spectrum. It's producing radiation at all frequencies. Um, it just seems that the microwave is the most, uh, the, the greatest density of energy is in the microwave range. Now I don't know how much greater that density is. They don't really explain that. Um, and I could argue that there is just as much uh, radiation in the other forms, like you know, closer together uh, like x-rays and stuff like that. So x-rays would be just bullets closer together. Radio waves would be bullets just much further apart. Okay, so that's all stuff that should be pretty easily understood. Now the trick is, what fools us, is that when we see photons, they're usually reflected off of something. So the photon went in with this pattern and it came back out with the pattern. Now sometimes the pattern shifted red shifted or blue shifted, the colors changed, um, like the um, spectral lines from helium or uh, argon or some kind of gas, you'll get back light at very specific energies. If you just shined ultraviolet light at it, you could get back a lot of different kinds of light. Um, but you have to shoot a kind of high frequency to be able to get the lower ones back. You can't shoot a low frequency and get higher ones back. So there's sort of the trick to it is that you have to heat it, uh, essentially. You have, to, you have to put more energy in, in terms of things being closer to each other, to, um, to be able to get the lower frequencies. So you can't make high frequencies out of low frequencies easy, but you can make low frequencies out of high frequencies fairly easily. Matter can do that. So again, so most of the photons we see, we see them because they reflected off of something or they were produced by a sun, uh, a nuclear object that's taking gravitational energy that's causing a great deal of pressure inside the sun. So everything, so you have to kind of understand that the sun is basically 
a furnace because of gravity. I mean, I don't know why they don't explain that. Just so, it's so obvious that the consequence of gravity, this constant acceleration of everything on the surface, and we, we can see it in the sense that you can see what happens with water pressure. You know, you get a few hundred feet on, down in water and the pressure starts getting relatively intense. And you go down 10,000 feet and it's crushing pressure, a ton of pressure. And that's just a clear representation that all the rocks and everything else in the earth are feeling that same pressure. You know, we, we you know, if you go deep underground, for example, you have to put some kind of support or the rocks will just push in and crush your cave because of the pressure. So there's an intense amount of pressure. Um, <laughs> if you're cutting holes through hard rock, then you're a little bit safer because the hard rock can take the pressure and your hole will stay the way you made it because you're cutting a hole through a big solid piece of rock. Um, but if you're cutting your hole through gravel or sand or mud or something, you'll see pretty quickly how fast the sides will crush in on you and smush you. So inside the center of the sun, that pressure is still there. So both sides are pushing from all sides. It's being pushed. And so there's a tremendous amount of pressure, and that's what creates the heat. So if you make any mass big enough, it sort of has to catch fire. It's like the inside of the earth they know is molten. Now, it's not molten because of little tugs with the moon or molten because there's tugs with the sun or some kind of other thing. It's molten because the surface is pushing towards the center of the earth and each piece of matter is applying an acceleration, a, a pressure um, that goes in it forward of it. I mean, everything's pushing. When I sit on a chair, the chair pushes down on the earth. That pressure has to keep going. Nothing neutralizes the pressure. Nothing gets rid of it it keeps pushing in and in the center of the earth it gets damn hot and in the sun, center of the sun which is much bigger it gets even fucking hotter and um, you know that's what gravity is doing so all that heat um, inside the sun is what's taking photons that are bullets you know little pieces of energy going in all kinds of directions and all kinds of ways uh, without any coherent frequency and it's filtering it through this whole process of electrons and protons that specifically, we'll do the proton with an X, um, that specifically channel the energy by reflecting one kind and letting another kind uh, leave perpendicular. This is why I really need another color. So I should, I'll get some crayons. Maybe I can do this in crayon. Um, and so. Uh, I don't know how else to, I guess I could do this a squiggly line or something, I don't know. <laughs> Put the arrow at the wrong end, <laughs> I don't know how to, how to distinguish the two, th these are two different kinds of force. So one force, let's say the round force comes out perpendicularly, the square force comes out um, as a reflection. And uh, both of them are doing that, and so by filtering they can end up taking the spaces out, you know, they can end up, this one gets filtered, this one gets filtered, and they can change the frequency of bullets that are, are energy that exists based on how these electrons and protons are moving. And as I pointed out, they're going to move based on the pressure between them. They don't have any will of their own to speak of. Um, they have just a, a condition of balance or imbalance. They have uh, positions in the boat. There's 10 seats for rowing. And if the electron is getting hit by more rowers from behind, then it's going to have more rowers in the boat um, rowing that right way and fewer rowing the wrong way. And so it'll go the right way. But it'll always neutralize because if it goes the right way and it moves, it'll get closer to another electron. So the idea is, is that electrons all be in positions where they don't, they're always going to be seeking a balanced position in the sense that there's never an electron that just shows up and there's no field force affecting it. They're always being affected by a field. And when they get into a neutral position, a position they can stay in, you know, that's a position where they can be static in for a while, um, they don't move out of, they don't move far out of, 
then they're really just being tied based on the pressure coming from both sides. And if the pressure from one side is um, weaker because it's at an angle, let's say, of two electrons, so you have an electron over here and an electron over here, so forget about him. Um, and so this pressure would be half as much coming from these two angles, um, but that would equal this much coming from straight because of the whole vector thing. There's this much portion in this direction, this much in this direction, and that equals the hypotenuse, which is, you know, whatever, 60% number, or some other thing. Well, anyway, it'll find this neutral position between now these three forces. And if it's shoved this way, as pointed out, that means it changes the balance inside the electron. So if there's a little more energy, this one moves closer. That means this one's going to feel more impacts because there's a reflection going back and forth, back and forth between these electrons. There's reflective energy back and forth, back and forth. So when this electron moves forward, it's going to create more pressure on this one and it's going to move too far in this direction. And then it's going to move a little bit too far in this direction. And then it's going to be even less too far this direction. And then a little less too far in this direction. So it's going to oscillate. So every movement is going to create oscillations. And those oscillations you can sort of understand as being, well, that's the photons. That's the bullets being released. The oscillations are the, the rebound. And that oscillation would have a distinct period based on the amount of pressure the electron's in. So it's under higher pressure, it's going to oscillate faster. It's under lower pressure, it's going to oscillate slower. And there's your frequency to create these different photons. So that's what's happening inside the sun. The sun creates enough pressure to start creating high frequencies. And they end up being visible photons and x-rays and all kinds of other stuff. Um, you know, very high frequency because of the high pressure. So the higher the pressure, the faster the oscillation, the overflow speed, the pendulum swings much faster under high pressure uh, because there's less movement. You know, they don't swing as far um, because a lot more bits are hitting, a lot more ping pong paddle, a lot more balls are hitting in a period of time, which means the overflow can never get very far out of control when there's high pressure. And um, so that's the origin of taking this pressure between electrons that's invisible, that doesn't have a frequency, and it's given a frequency just by you initiating an action. So you push an electron forward, that's going to cause the next electron to oscillate. And that oscillation can create a photon, or a radio wave, or uh, a piece of x-ray uh, emission, depending on how much pressure the electron's in how close the electrons are and how much stuff is moving between them. Uh, how much energy is captured between them, caught between the ping pong paddles. Right, so that was a point I wanted to make. It's just that photons are sort of a creation and photons can be annihilated in the sense that not the quanta, not the energy of the photon, but the ability for us to see it as a photon can be destroyed, but you're not destroying the fundamental energy. It will be released as heat. It will be released as something at a slower energy. So you could put, um, this is like, like a really obvious example, you can put ultraviolet light into something and a bunch of infrared light energy will come out of it. Um, heat. Evidence of heat. And it's evidence of heat is because that's the standard pressure between atoms. The reason why infrared is created is because atoms bang into each other and are um, they have a semi-consistent, a certain range of um, um, ex they're always going to hit the outside of each other first and the outside electrons have the least amount of pressure and so when they bounce into each other, they're really bouncing off the external electrons. And the electrons are of a very similar amount of pressure. So when two atoms collide, there's a similar amount of um, um, elasticity to the, to the pressure. The pressure increases, and then the, uh, the atoms are pushed apart. And so 
the reason why they they all end up creating something that's always in the infrared range, generally speaking, is because that's the most common interaction between two atoms. Now you can cause an uncommon one in that you can get an atom moving even faster into another atom and then you can create an impact that has more energy in it. But the standard momentum of atoms is in a certain range and that standard momentum creates infrared radiation. I don't know how else to say that. It's a little more deep I mean, it's a little more complicated, but it really just has to do with the fact that atoms don't bounce off the interior electrons. They bounce off the surface electrons. All right, and the surface electrons tend to have a standard amount of pressure. All right, so what else to say? Um, just because you're kind of going from, from high, high amount of pressure on the inside to the least amount of pressure on the outside, where you can almost say it goes from um, where electrons are, are, yeah, I mean, where they're the most attracted to the proton in the center and most repelled by each other. So, you, again, you have to understand this argument. The electrons don't like each other. So, if you put four of them in an arrangement, they could say they're very attracted, strong attraction to the proton in the middle, but they have an equally strong repulsion to each other. So they can't get any closer. You can sort of understand in some kind of arrangement like this. Because if this one tries to get closer, it means it has to get closer to these electrons. And these electrons won't let it get any closer to them. So it can't get any closer to the proton. Now, as you get further away from the proton, this the strength of this attraction gets weaker and weaker. And so this the the bound strength of the, these external electrons is always going to be kind of consistent because it's reaching near zero. That is, they're so weakly connected, um, attached, um, that you could say they're, call them free electrons in a sense, because they're not essential to the real formation of the atom. They're just uh, loosely associated with the atom. And so I would argue that all atoms have electrons that are loosely associated. They're not part of the atomic number um, because they're not held with any, enough strength to be binding. That is, you can't connect two atoms by sharing one of these electrons because the strength of the bond to the proton is too weak and it'll just drift off with the other atom. So those are the electrons, these semi-free ones, um, Again, free doesn't really work with electrons because they're always going to find a neutral place. They're going to keep moving until they find a place where the force from all directions is equal. That's what electrons seek. That's where they have to end up. They can't, they can't ever be in a static position unless the force is balanced in every direction. If it isn't, they're going to move where there's a weakness, where there's a lower pressure. Um, so that's why infrared radiation is so common is because that's what's essentially the weak pressure of the loosely held uh, non-atomic number non-essential electrons the electrons that always atoms always collect um, especially on surfaces so again we're back to the surface argument and how the double slit experiment is really about light traveling through the surfaces which have a lot of electrons and the light is being refracted by the electrons it's deflecting off of them it's being absorbed and readmitted by the electrons in a, at a different angle an angle representing um, the pressure of those electrons it hits all right, uh, the, their position associated with another electron. If the electron is here and it, there's another electron here and you hit the electron this way with the light, you can sort of understand that the electron is going to move this way and therefore the light would go that way, the photon. And you can also understand if there was an electron here and an electron here and you hit it here, well, then the light's going to go straight because it'll come out of that other electron straight. So it really depends on 
not how the electron is moving, but how the electron is associated with other electrons is going to decide which angle the light takes. Alright, so maybe that's enough for this video. I mean, it's a big subject, photon in general, but it's really just about this energy stuff. And again, so it has to be explained that we can't see, uh, you know, if this is how the frequency goes, it goes this specific distance, we'll call that a one, and then this next one is one and a half. Okay, and this next one is, uh, you know, a half. And so if the bullets are at uneven frequency, there could be a hundred of them. We wouldn't be able to detect any of it. So you could have a whole stream of electromagnetic radiation that consisted of one bullet, the next bullet's uh, 75 hertz, the next bullet is 30 hertz, the next bullet is 5,000 hertz. The next bullet is, you know, in terms of distance from each other. They're so irregular. We can't detect that, that kind of radiation. We have no device that can see that. It's invisible. Because all our devices need there to be a certain consistency. It needs to be hit by at least three or four of these bullets before it can see it. Our eye has to be hit with six of them, all going the same, all with the same exact period. So if you if you'd have three and then have the period closer, and then three, we don't see it. <laughs> okay, so you, you, it can't be um, mixed. So any mixed radiation is invisible to us. And that's essentially what I'm arguing is gravity. It's a bunch of stuff at varying frequency. So it's a ray coming at you. Gravity is a ray of bullets, and they're separated by different distances. Okay, no consistency in the distances. So you're, there's no way to pick it up. There's no, way, there's no way to make a receiver that can receive that because all our devices for the electrons to be hit in a way that causes current to flow, they have to be pressurized a very specific way. They have to be hit before they rebound and hit again before they rebound and hit again before they rebound. And if they're not hitting that sequence, if there's too much time between when they're hit, then the electron rebounds to its original position and you have to start all over again. So let's say you need to hit it three times within one second to get to the amount of compression you want. Well, you have to hit it, <laughs> okay, before it rebounds. So if there's any gap in where you're hitting it between those bullets, that's enough time for it to rebound, then you're always starting back at zero again. And so you pushed it in, but you let it go back, and then you pushed it in, and you let it go back, and you pushed it in, and you let it go back. That's not going to get you here. That's only going to get you this little distance. And you need to get this much compression for you to cause the creation of the photon. It's that kind of idea. That kind of theory, uh, theoretically, uh, a system that depends on a tipping point idea where it has to be at the right harmonic, the right resident pressure has to be applied or you can't tip it over. So I've made the tipping argument so many times. I mean, it's a real thing, tipping points. And that's exactly how what I think is the fundamental mechanism inside of a, an atom with its electrons you have to hit it in such a way that you cause it to tip. You cause the electron to move enough to cause the reaction of the photons, the creation of a release of quanta because the electron vibrates. So you push it in deep enough, then it overshoots, it reshoots, it overshoots, it reshoots, it overshoots, it reshoots. It needs to be forced to oscillate, and you can't get any oscillation if it just does this. It's not going to oscillate enough at a high enough frequency for us to detect it. Okay, now that's probably enough of the video. Alright, so, uh, until the next time, uh, awaiting the Pyro video, and we'll see what happens. Be interesting, I'm just, just curious. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> curious. 
what he has to say. Anyway, um, so till the next time. Such. And no, I have to do it this way. Right click. I right clicked. Save recording is good enough. Okay. Ciao. First time I ever said that. I really hate that about pop culture. Every now and then it gets you to say something. And you're just like, oh, it just made me say that. I don't think I've called somebody a dude yet in any kind of relaxed way. Like, in any way but a satirical way. But, you're, you know, yeah, you're just like, oh. The, you know, they pollute you with their gibberish, these people. <laughs> you know, I hate it. Uh, anyway, till next time. And such. <laughs>